I do. This is Natalie. This, she's a good friend of mine. We met through TRE. We actually work for the same brokerage. And she is going to share her amazing story of being in the military, other things that happened along the way. And she's got an amazing story. And I just fell in love with her when I met her. And we went over to a client at Vine's house and um, spent some time and just had a fun time there. <laughs> that was funny. But um, we won't talk about that. Um, Natalie, welcome. Thank you for joining me on my show. I just love you and I can't wait to hear your story. So share away. Okay. Uh, well, I'm Natalie. Yeah, um, I, I guess I'll introduce myself and then uh, if you want some prompts for content, um, I'm all for it. Uh, Natalie Felder, I'm a licensed realtor in the state of Texas. Uh, we're both with the same brokerage, Type D Real Estate, and I couldn't be happier. I made the move from Keller Williams um, a little over a year ago, and it was a really smart switch. It was kind of nerve-wracking at first, only because, you know, it's like when you start somewhere, it feels more like that, that starts off as being home. But, you know, opportunities, I, I had more opportunity at Type D, and that's what I was looking to do is maximize, get the most use out of my license. Um, prior to that, I worked in the service industry for well over a decade. <laughs> I was a bartender and um, it was like a supplement for social life that I didn't have, <laughs> uh, all the while making really good money. But that's a, that's a, that's a young man game and one, pretty much once you're over 30, it's like a hard no. Like uh, I worked at Coyote Ugly for a hot minute. Nice. Uh, no. <laughs> no. I really wanted to find to know if I could get the job like that's really all I was I showed up for was like would they hire me then that's it was cool. like three weeks later I'm like you can keep it oh was it bad what happened um, I just I was a dancing monkey on a stage that was it that was my job I was a dancing monkey on a stage and yeah and a bartender? it's like they have rules oh yeah yeah because all the bartenders have to do two songs on two songs off on the stage and so you know it's like during day shift, there's only so many dance moves you actually have before you're just like, you know, being Carlton yeah, right. trying to keep everybody entertained. And it was just, it was, it was weird. It's uh, yeah. not my job. Not for you. Um, but uh, yeah. And then prior to that, I was in the army. Um, I wasn't in very long. I was in for two years. I was a water purification specialist. When I joined, I was a total idealist. Um, I thought I was going to be handing clean glasses of water to Iraqi children and making a difference. And that's just not at all. Uh, that's not what happened at all. Um, but it was, it was an incredible experience. I met some amazing people. It gave me a degree of discipline that I never would have otherwise had. Um, the ability to be thick skinned and persevere over and above everything else. Um, and yeah, it was, uh, it feels, feels like it feels like an eon ago, which it was, I joined in 2005 and I got out in 2007. Um, when I became a mom, um, I was going to be deployed for 18 months when my daughter was only two months old and I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it. Um, I'd wanted that. I wanted her for so long and I would have missed everything. I would have missed her first words, her first steps. Um, and I, could have missed out on her entire life. And um, I applaud the women that have the strength to go overseas after having children. Like that takes, that takes guts that a lot of people like me don't have and uh, a dedication to the mission. And um, plus I was stationed on Fort Hood, um, which I'm sure like a lot of people have read plenty of news articles about what happens on Fort Hood and it is absolutely 100% accurate and correct. What happens? Um, I, I'm not sure. There's a joke. Oh, um, just female soldiers being killed or going missing, just disappearing. Really? And um, a lot. Of, yes, yes. Uh, Tell I'm me really about that. I'm really proud of Vanessa. Well, so I guess the most prominent name is Vanessa Gullion. And she she's very blessed to have had the family that she had. They did not stop rattling chains. They did not go quietly into the night. They still to this day make a lot of noise to get Fort Hood to acknowledge 
where they're going wrong. And she had been uh, getting sexually harassed by one of her sergeants. Um, she had told her mother about it. And then she just oh, disappeared. Sorry, and it movie? turns out that the yeah, then the that sergeant was... had actually murdered her in the armory and disposed of her body. And when the day that I got to Fort Hood, there was actually a woman's body discovered off of north, uh, off of the north coast. So it was, um, it's a, something that a lot of my male uh, colleagues would joke about is that women deserve a service medal for surviving Fort Hood. Um, so it was just, it was one of those experiences that I, I had walked in um, believing my career was going to look a very specific way because my whole family had been military. They were all part military. Um, my great grandfather was uh, decorated with a Naval Cross. Um, my grandfather had been shot down out of an airplane, um, refused to take the Purple Heart, but he was a pilot in the Marine Corps. And um, like, that's just, that's what my family does is we serve this country and we have an illustrious military career. But I remember my grandfather warning me before I joined um, that things were going to be very different because I was a woman. And I was, you know, I was raised by a very, you know, very strong mother who was just like, no, women can do anything men can do. And I remember being like, no, it's going to go the way I think it's going to go. No. Yeah. But it was a phenomenal experience. Nonetheless, I'm very blessed for it. I'm grateful for it. I learned a whole lot in a very short amount of time. And I'm a stronger woman because of it. And then, yeah, uh, my time after the military was a little weird. Um, just because when when you're when you join, you're you're told when to eat, you're told what to do, you're told all these like you don't have to think, you just show up. And tell me, um, tell me this. So when you joined. Like I was talking to you about Rob, what did you have to do to get in, like to get qualified, you know, like what physical and mental activities did you have to do and achieve and successfully complete before you could get in? And what happened during that? And what was it like? Really nothing. Um, so really? when you, you know, first step to joining the military is going and talking to a recruiter um, who will pump you up and just tell you whatever it takes to get you in the MEPS. And then you go to MEPS, which is uh, Military Entry Processing, I think is what it stands for. And when you join uh, MEPS, you go through a physical, you're asked a whole bunch of questions. Um, they do background checks, fingerprinting, you know, just making sure you're not like a crazy person that's, you know, joining for no reason. Um, but then, yeah, after you go through MEPS um, and you do all your things, they help you pick a job. Uh, some offer sign on bonuses, some don't. I picked one that had a bonus, because money. Um, <laughs> and uh, then yeah, you're sworn in and they give you a ship off date. I remember I didn't want any grass to grow under my feet because I really was afraid I might change my mind. Um, so from the point I went through MEPS to the day I showed up to basic training was 11 days. I wasted no time. And uh, now once you get to basic, it's that's a whole nother story. Um, it looks a lot different now than it did when I was in because uh, when I joined, it was um, oh gosh, there's not really a whole lot. There's not a really good diplomatic way to put it. Um, the military was harder when I joined, um, and it was intentionally so, and I feel like it should be. Um, you know, you're facing going into war. You are facing being shot at. You're facing a whole lot of things that you really need to be mentally prepared for and people tiptoeing around your feelings or your emotions is <laughs> that the enemy is not going to grant you that courtesy <laughs> so um you know it's just one of those things that i don't really understand what the military is doing today as much as it did um but it was it was physically very rigorous um you know the first week was kind of a joke <laughs> Uh, when we got there, you know, the first week is getting your uniforms and getting used to waking up at four o'clock in the morning and working out and doing all these things, which kind of worked out a day in my life before I showed up. Like yeah. it was, I remember um, we were, we were at one place uh, for the first week getting our uniforms and whatnot. And then, and then we were going to join our normal training unit 
Um, and I joined on Fort Jackson, which everyone was saying, oh, this is Relax in Jackson, Relax in Jackson. It's going to be easy. No. Um, <laughs> uh, so the day we leave to join our training unit, um, we had all of our, we had our personal gear in a bag. We had all of our military gear in a duffel bag and, um, we loaded all the duffel bags onto a pickup truck and they drove away. And so we're all laughing, ha ha, he he, having a merry old time. And they're like, okay, everyone load up on the bus. So we front load our personal bags, you know, we're carrying it on our chest and, uh, we're sitting down, you know, everybody's talking, being jovial. Can I cuss on here? Yes. Do what you need okay. to do. So then this drill sergeant walks on the bus and is like, shut the fuck up. And the whole bus went silent. Wow. And he's like, put your face in your bag. And I'm like, what does it mean? And I was like thinking I needed to unzip it and like put my, I didn't know what to do. Girl, like it was just, the only girl there? Uh, no, no, there were, there were uh, several other females here, but um, okay. it was a, uh, it was, it was a really interesting experience. So he's like, you know, put your face in your bag and he's walking down the aisle and literally shoving people's face into your bag. So all you had to just do was bury your face, you know, like there. And I remember he's like, if I, I swear to God, if I hear anyone talk, I'll fucking kill you. Wow. And I'm like, I'm like, oh God. <laughs> okay. And I remember, <laughs> See you later. <laughs> I remember turning my face to the girl next to me. I'm like, are we really going to die? She's like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> we're all just, the whole bus is gone. You know, it's like, we're, we're not looking at where we're going. We're just like, we're completely blind to what's coming next. And I remember shaking, like I was just like my adrenaline had really kicked in. And so, um, and so, you know, we're driving around and it's like, it felt like an eternity, but we really didn't end up going that far. And uh, then when the bus comes to the stop, he starts going, get off the bus, move, move, move. And then um, when it came to, uh, <laughs> there were sergeants actually tripping us as we're getting out of the bus. They're like sticking their foot out and tripping us because we've got like 60 pounds worth of our personal gear on the front of our chest. And I remember like it was raining and there's like this big steep incline and we're running up there and he's like, get your, per get your duffel bag. And they were all in just this giant pile. And we're like, oh, no. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> and um, so I found mine and I'm like, how am I gonna, so I loaded the duffel bag on the back, reloaded my personal bag on the front. <laughs> and he's, you know, there was a number spray painted on the bottom and that was the floor we were supposed to go to. Mine was number four. There were stairs right in front of me, right in front of me. So I'm like, okay, well, I'll just take the stairs. <laughs> he started screaming at me. He's like, do you think you're special? You're not special. Use the service stairs. And so I'm like looking around and it's like these like really jagged, just like base, almost a spiral staircase. So I'm hauling ass up there and just like, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, so we're going through this and, uh, we get in there and we walk into this big bay where all these bunks are lining the walls and I'm walking in the middle and then three drill sergeants get in my face saying, get out of my kill zone. And I'm like, what is a kill zone? I don't know what a kill zone is. And so I'm like, at this point, I am crying. I am yeah. in tears. And so I'm just, I'm looking around and I'm like, okay, just do what everyone else is doing. And everybody's standing next to a bunk and running in place. So I just find an empty spot and start running. And I'm crying, I'm crying so hard. And there's a drill sergeant standing next to me. He's like, you should just quit. You should just quit. Oh. You're not cut out for this. And I remember getting so mad. I'm like, <sighs> <laughs> and, um, so, I mean, this goes on for like an hour and then they have us like all pick our personal bags up over our heads and then drop it. And then they to be make us do it over and over and over again. And the goal was for us to drop the bags in unison. So he should only hear one bag drop. Oh. Of course we can't do that. Right. <laughs> it's going to happen. And then after that, it calms down. We set up our bunks and um, then real life and training began and uh it was it was just it was a, it was hard at first but it was really just i remember leaving basic being really happy i was in the best shape of my life um i had met some really incredible people had some amazing experiences nick at night um which is the night infiltration course was probably my favorite it's like we're crawling in the dirt and, you know that, there's yeah. like, grenades going off around us and they're shooting live rounds over our head but they had so tracers on them. 
So it is crazy. Yeah. Like, yeah. okay. So it's, okay. It, it was gnarly. It was very, very gnarly, but it was, uh, it was, it was, it was wonderful. I wouldn't trade it for anything. And I remember trying to reenlist at one point, but they had changed their tattoo policy. So you had to be able to cover your tattoo with one hand while wearing a PT uniform. And this one was just too big. So. Dang. Oh, well. Really? They have a tattoo policy. Mm -hmm. They've, and they change it. It depends on who's in, uh, who's in, in command of the military. And like, so they'll, they'll change it every now and again. Uh, like at one point they didn't care as long as you didn't have tattoos on your face or your hands. Yeah, but so it flip flops, but at the time, and then I just got old and I'm like, nah, I'm good. I'm good. So tell me about, tell me about being in there and being a woman. And of course you're a badass and, um, just what the guys were like, were they just tell me about what happened and what's going on and what, what, like, how was it in Fort Hood? And what, what went down? <clears throat> So by and large, I was very blessed to have made a lot of really incredible friends that were not only female, but also male. Um, I would say most of my colleagues, um, most of my peers uh, respected me and um, weren't uh, demeaning, I guess. They weren't demeaning in any way. They treated me as though I was an equal. Leadership, however, was very, very different. Um, I was sexually assaulted by my sergeant, and um, I remember trying to tell my other leadership who immediately shut that down, and I just, I, I remember having this feeling as though, like, I better not say anything. I really need to just keep my mouth shut, um, and it's, it was, I wasn't the only female that experienced that in, within my own unit. Um, this guy actually, I think, had done it to several other women beforehand. And um, but it was just, it was, it was very strange. At one point, a bunch of all the women's underwear had gone missing out of this particular barracks. Um, they found the guy who had just been going into the uh, washers and dryers that we all had, per, like they had like a, a laundry room per barracks. And yeah. um, they, <laughs> like this guy had just been taking women's underwear. Well, <laughs> it's sort of crazy. Just, Sorry. It was just, it was very strange. It was very, it was a, it was a really interesting experience. And, I um, I'm just, I'm, it, it taught me a lot about myself though. Um, so, you know, is with military sexual trauma, it's, it's, it's very easy to get focused on the offender or the perpetrator and want to try to assign blame or, you know, rationalize the why. And, in therapy, I've learned that that is kind of an act of futility. You know, um, you can you can try to make sense of it if that's what your brain needs or wants to do. But the best thing that I've found is to focus on yourself and what did I gain from this? Sure, I lost, but I gained, and um, and I gained quite a bit. It took me a while to gain it because it was it was just so confusing because I, I I there were things that I wanted. That I wasn't able to get because um now wait a minute so you're talking about yourself now what happened with this guy like is he in jail nothing. or nope nothing happened okay nope. so, sorry Ronnie just walked in and he's got his phone going are you able to see it now yeah I can I can see it okay we'll go out in the other room so it doesn't echo um <laughs> okay sorry um so nothing happened what do you mean nothing happened so nothing is going on. Nothing's going on with this guy. He's still in in charge. I have no idea. I have no idea what happened to him. Uh, he was married. It was it was one of those. It, it's it's a situation that if I'm if I'm being transparent and honest, I think there's a part of me that kind of saw it coming, but I didn't expect it. Um, I had it's. Uh, I'd known the sergeant. He wasn't my sergeant per se, because we were all quartermasters. Um, so I was water purification and he was the supply sergeant. So we, we all worked together. We were all familiar with each other, but um, you know, it was just, he'd never been inappropriate with me. So he's like, Hey, do you want to go grab lunch? I'm like, yeah, I don't want to eat at the defect. Um, so I hop in his truck and as we're driving out of post, he's just commenting on how pretty he thought I was. And I saw his wedding ring and I'm like, 
I bet your wife's pretty too, huh? And he's like, oh he yeah, that. she just had a baby. Um, and she hasn't been very interested in me lately. And I don't fucking care. Yeah, it's right. none of my business. And um, instead of driving, we drove by McDonald's. We drove by a, probably like a Burger King or a Jack in the Box or something. And I remember being like, where were you planning on going? You know, we only have 30 minutes. And he pulls into one of these, uh, uh, like, rent by the hour motel rooms uh, just outside of Post. And I remember thinking, I need to run. I need to jump out and run. But the unfortunate thing with military sexual trauma is during training, you are, you, it is drilled into your mind. You do not disobey. You do whatever your sergeant says. And it's, your, your rational brain stops working. I, I feel your rational brain stops working as well as it rightfully should. And so long story short, um, we were in and out and I went back on post and I tried to tell my sergeants who immediately shut it down. And, um, when you say shut it, down, I tried it down, like they just didn't want to hear you. Yes. Basically they were, they were, uh, they were battering me for having gone in the first place. It was my Were there any females that and leaders I'm, that you could have gone to? Or were there? I mean, it's yeah. at the time, there was no open door policy with your superiors. You went, you know, you went from to your sergeant who then would determine whether or not it went to the commander. And then that commander would then determine if it needed to go further up the chain. And wow. so um, I, it's, you know, and I'm sure I probably could have like burst through the door for my captain or something and like forced him to listen. But it was just, it was one of those situations where I, you know, I was 21 years old. I didn't know any better. I was young and didn't know what I know now. And I remember trying to talk to a, a doctor on Fort Hood who um, suggested that I actually get discharged for adjustment disorder. And then um, I, my sergeants decided I need to see a different doctor who was a military doctor who completely disagreed with what they said. And I just let it go after that is what it is. I'm assuming that. No, happens. I mean, really, I am so grateful that my experience wasn't worse because for Vanessa Gouillon and countless other women across the United States and even on bases that aren't in the United States experienced it and still experience it to this day. I feel like if we can start removing the stigma of it being this shameful, you know, dark, dirty secret that we have to hide, it's nothing's going to change as long as we're, as long as it, if it turns into a pity party, it's like, no, it happened. I'm stronger now. I know myself better now. I'm better because of what I had to go through in order to get here and not break. And so I'm, I, I'm, I know that you sharing your story, there's a big delay. I'm sorry. Like you talk and it's a big delay, but you sharing your story is going to help so many women. Um, and I hope that they hope. reach out to you. Yeah. And, and I don't, I'm not sure what you do today as far as doing any kind of anything with that, with sharing your story. Cause I know it's gotta be hard. Um, are there anybody, is there anything you have going on right now that you, you are maybe helping women through this or maybe have an idea of doing it or maybe you need some, you know? Um, it, I mean, beyond being just a quote unquote safe space to talk about it, um, really that's all I can do is just um, be the ear that some women need to have in order to accept and understand that this is, this is a very unfortunate part of military life that needs to change. And the only way it's going to change is if we show up and say, fuck you, this happened, this happened. And um, I've got How an incredible connection. Voice? How can I help you do that? Like really like it needs to, it needs to happen. So how can we like as women and men that agree with this, go and make a difference at Fort Hood? How can we well, do that? Really the best way is to write your congressman. The best thing you can do is to write your congressman and start demanding that this become something that is in the spotlight and, you know, write the president, <laughs> write yeah. the, uh, write the leadership on different military posts and start making this a, a clear, uh, making this more of a clear shot for women to be able to come forward and say, this is not okay. This happened to me. This was real. 
and you know, it's, I, 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 in a way I feel for leadership because I know that there is, I'm sure that there are some people that fabricate that are dishonest and that's really unfortunate because it, it minimizes the experience of many women. Yes. But the best thing to do is to be an ear, to listen, to congratulate them on making it through because it's, um, you know, it's, it's very easy for someone to make you disappear. Very, very easy. That's scary. And if you, it is. It's freaking like, terrifying. Scary. I, I saw that, that movie on that girl and it, it scared me. I watched it like two or three times and I just yeah. was like, wow. And so were, what is, how did you leave the military? Like, how did you, did, were you honorably discharged? Were you, did you leave? What, how, okay. Was it, so I received an honorable discharge in October of 2007, I think. God, can't believe it's been almost 20 years. Holy shit. Um, yeah, I got out in uh, late, later in the year in 2007. Um, and I actually got out on pregnancy. I got awesome. a chapter eight discharge, which is where I basically, I didn't have a family care plan that was willing to step up and care for my daughter while I was overseas. Um, like my, my mom was willing to, but she had COPD, asthma, and emphysema, and she was just constantly in and out of the hospital. So it was just, there was no way, there's no way. And, um, so they gave me uh, the way it was presented to me is that I had two options. Um, I could just sign my rights over to somebody completely like my, he wasn't my husband at the time, but the man that I would end up marrying, I could sign my rights over to his side of the family. He told me all about his upbringing. I'm like, Fuck no, no, or I could take the chapter eight and get out. And really what I should have done is I should have just said, no, I'm going to stay in. I'm going to continue to do my time. And if you can't accommodate me, then so be it. Then I get a different kind of discharge. But I was just like, you know what? I'm done. I want to be able to sleep with both eyes closed for a change. So I just, I, I took the easy way out for lack of a better term. So Natalie, you posted um, last night about Tina Turner and her relationship with her man. Tell me about that. Um, tell me about your story on that and what happened. I know we have a little, it's 11 o'clock, but tell me, well, we have 30 more minutes. So if you, if you want okay. to, you don't have to. Yeah, um, no, and it's how like, is it like how is it? no shame in anything. Cause it's, it's not me that did it. <laughs> yeah, right. So tell me about um so so you had a you had a daughter. Whose daughter whose daughter is this your is this the guy that you were with, the Tina Turner guy? Or is this a new guy? Who is who's your daughter? Who's your daughter's dad? So so when I was in the military I met a guy and we had dated briefly and then he started dropping the L word like six weeks into the relationship and I'm like, dude, no, you can't love me. You don't know me. Um and so I dumped him. And, um, we ended up reconnecting and I got pregnant that following weekend. Um, and it was, it was it's kind of like pity a little bit. Um, yeah. but you know, he really, at the time he was a nice guy. He was a super nice guy. He was very doting, sent me flowers, all this other stuff. Um, and, uh, we began, we got married, uh, shortly after I got out. Um, so that way I could stay on TRICARE and all that other fun jazz. And then he deployed uh, throughout pretty much the majority of my pregnancy. And when he came home, he wasn't the same. He was, there was like even some, there, there, like his eyes were different. It was like body snatcher kind of feeling. And he just, he became this incredibly angry, abusive person. He actually ripped open my C-section stitches at one point. And um, so when I left... I left with my daughter, our diaper bag, and the clothes on my back. And I tried going to a friend's house first. And um, I walked, God, it was probably maybe like a mile and a half with my daughter. I knocked on her door and she's like, I don't want to get involved. Handed me a blanket for my kiddo and then shut the door in my face. Wow. So I remember um, I was walking through the apartment complex trying to figure out how I could maybe get to my car, what I was going to do next. Cause like this was incredibly spur of the moment. <coughs> Um, there were these two women standing outside and I remember running to them and just saying, would you please take my daughter upstairs? Don't let her leave your home for any reason. I just need to use your phone to call the police. 
And she's like, oh, no, honey. Oh, no, honey. You're coming upstairs with us. So these two women got us upstairs. And I remember I called the police and it was a Monday. I called the police and hours went by and they never showed up. And so I finally called a friend, told her what was happening. She called leadership, told them what was happening. And um, his, his leadership showed up before the police did. Yeah, I haven't been back since. Um, you know, the, the abuse was is more mental and emotional than it was physical. Um, he gave my daughter a black eye. And I busted open my C-section stitches. And it was just, it was, it was an ugly situation that kept getting uglier. And, um, you know, I, there's a lot I didn't want to leave behind, but I had to, I, it was like that or my life. And so, um, I just, I took what I could and he destroyed like most of her toys. He destroyed all of my clothes. He tried pawning a lot of my, uh, like knickknacks and whatnot that I had. And, um, I just, I didn't have much left. And so I had to rebuild my entire life. But, um, I remember I, when I left, I went and I stayed with a friend and <coughs> broken into, and my, the only thing that went missing, there were tools and everything. The only thing that went missing was my guitar and my, uh, stroller. And so I'm like, okay, I know he did this. I know he did this. Um, but then a friend opened up their door for me in Austin. And that's how I got here. And uh, a few weeks later, I got a job at a place called Whitehall Jewelers in Lakeline Mall. And uh, it was a really, really sweet gig. Like they paid $15 an hour and like had 10% commissions. And I'm like, whoa, wow. bet. It's like an eight. <laughs> so, when was that, 2007? I made $8 uh, an hour. <laughs> 2008. Oh, it was a cake ass job. And I mean, I yeah. sold, oh girl, I sold some jewelry. And so I, I ended up making... I know I made a lot of money in a real short amount of time, but, um, I was able to get my first place on my own, which was an apartment. Um, it was a sliding scale apartment in Cedar park and I didn't really have a whole lot of money for, uh, furniture and things. So I just combed the free section of Craigslist and I had a, a little Ford F-150 with an extended bed and I just went and picked up a bunch of furniture and then I cruised like around far West and like all the ritzy neighborhoods around Austin and just take whatever they had sitting out by the curb Girl, and hey. um <laughs> yeah no sh I'm not, i'll dumpster dive i don't care they had um, a lot of, they yeah. had a lot of nice stuff out like you just go out like way i mean there's always stuff out there ronnie and i used to do that we used to do garage so yes nice stuff if they had facebook marketplace back then i would have been so happy um, i know i know but yeah but, uh, yeah it was a. Uh, it was it was it was the it was the fire that forged me. It was it was the true test of can I do this? And I wouldn't I wouldn't have been able to have survived that if I hadn't have been in the military. So as much ugliness that presented itself in my youth, it really was the most. Inc it, I'm so grateful for all of it. It's made me a better mother. It's made me a more aware friend. It's made me a, a more aware person. And um, it's it's evidence that I can, that anyone can get past that. Thank you. <laughs> and Tina Turner really an inspiration for being able to leave. You know, she went like, my God, my situation wasn't nearly as bad as hers. And she went through hell and back and just came out glowing on the other side. And I just remember being like, amazing woman. I think I can, I know just an incredible human being and a true inspiration for just having faith in not only the higher power that exists, but yourself as well. Like you have to believe you have to, you have to bank on yourself and, um, God bless her for that because I wouldn't made it without her. I'm so glad you came out on the other side and, and left. And I know for me, I'll just share one of the worst things that happened to me. Um, I was with a guy and he picked me up by my throat and threw me across the room. And I ended up at the top of the wall and went and slid down the wall. That was probably the worst thing I could not. I mean, yeah, I've been hit and this and that, but that right there, that was one of the worst things. I remember walking out of my apartment. I had a sweatshirt on and underwear and that was it. And I had my phone and it was not a cell phone. It was a, you know, one of those phones, a home phone. Right. And I was calling the police while I was outside and I had to go hide in a bush because I was in an apartment complex and they came and got him and Ronnie and I got together. He, he 
he um, saved me from that, <laughs> got out of that relationship. But um, I can relate, I know. And I, I can't relate to the, um, the whole being in the military. I mean, if I could have, I probably would have, but I didn't. Um, I was probably a wimp, I, you know, but I, I just love that, <laughs> the fact that you're, you're a badass and, you know, I love guns too. And, you know, you just, it's awesome, you know, and, and I'm surprised you didn't turn around and use it on that guy. Anyway, I would have. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember, like, when my ex-husband gave my daughter a black eye, I was yeah, like, I won't go into hell with that day, but I remember I had my little thirty eight. And I, I actually ended up pulling it on him and I pointed it at his head and I'm like, this ends today. There you go. And, and, help. and so I remember my finger was on the trigger and I'm just like, I can pull this, I can pull this and end this right now. I could yes. just, I could do it. But then again, thank you for the military because I trigger discipline. I immediately flash forward everything that could possibly happen if I pulled that trigger. That's trigger discipline. Yeah, he would he would die. I would get arrested. My daughter would go to foster care, and I don't know when I would see her next. And so it was just you know, like, yeah, I could have, probably should have. Um, no, I shouldn't have. I, should have. I did the right thing. Um, <laughs> oh my god! I but, can't, if you really gave my daughter a black eye, I would have shot him. I literally would have shot him. I, and I don't took, have it, so I I can't it do that. Everything in me not to pull that trigger. It How took, did you give her a black it, eye? I, Energy. Yes. Um, How do you do so that? I was asleep and um, I don't really know exactly what happened, um, but I woke up to hearing my daughter cry and I'm like, what, what is going on? So I walk out and I can hear it coming from the bathroom. And so I open the bathroom door and he's got this wash rag and he's scrubbing her face and like the water coming from the sink is so hot. It's steaming up. And I remember being like, what the fuck are you doing? And so I took her. And I'm like, he's like, little shit made a mess. And like, I could tell in her high chair that there was oatmeal everywhere. And I'm like, dude, she's a, she's not even a year old. Or like, she's, she was like, yeah, she was 11 months old at the time. She was 11 months old. I remember being like, what do you expect a baby to do? And then after a few minutes, this bruise starts showing up on her cheek. And it had three really distinctive marks. And I'm like, what did you do? And he didn't say anything. I was like, what did you do? <laughs> and um, that's when I went and got the gun. Yeah, that's right? I, I was like, yeah, we're doing it's like, because it's just, oh, oh, it's a, it's a mama bear. I, so I like, he got I, messed up in that. He got messed up over wherever, where was he? What happened? He was, he got really, what happened? You know what happened to he him? He was in Afghanistan and, um, you know, it's, I, I, I couldn't find out what was happening as it was happening because it's, it's OPSEC, um, you know, operational security. You can't, you can't disclose what's happening because they are listening. Like the enemy is li always listening in and sometimes even watching. And so, um, <coughs> you know, it was just several times where he would go into coma blackout which was pretty characteristic when somebody dies um, they will cease all communication the family is notified and so um, there were several times where i would go two or three weeks without even hearing from him and that's because they were trying to handle uh, getting notification to the family so that way he the family like, didn't find out what's what? it called again what's it called again so he was almost dead yeah. or what it's called combo blackout and it's just where they stop all communicate all outgoing communications from the post in order to give the allow the family to be properly notified rather than you know this this guy tells then tells this girl and then who then calls that girl and then calls the family and tells them um they so need what to do they do? Shut your down or how do they i mean certain yeah, people just, they, down or everybody's just phone? Everyone's okay. So like okay. they didn't have cell phones back then. They had like, you know, like regular phone. It was like a, a satellite phone. Yeah. That everyone got to you. They just stopped. You couldn't log on to the internet. You couldn't <laughs> um, make phone calls out. You couldn't make any outgoing phone calls. Uh, there was no incoming. What do they do now? Uh, so, I mean, the only thing that like, I mean, I have no idea. Yeah. I mean, don't. I'd imagine with how quickly it looked with how much communication has advanced, they probably have like, more instant notification to where they can, you know, deploy these messengers to go to immediately to the family and notify them. But sometimes people are hard to locate. So. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So you thought he was dead. I had no idea. Um, yeah. But until and I remember um, every knock at the door, 
I didn't know who was going to be yeah. on the other side. I remember one time there was a soldier on the other side and I opened the door and he's just like, I'm looking for, um, I'm, I'm looking for the leasing office. And I'm like, oh, you're really like, <laughs> but you know, h- hindsight, you know, there's also kind of a part where I'm just like, I mean, I'm, what, if he had have died, I would have been like half a million dollars richer and I wouldn't have gone through any of that crap. But, Is that you what know. you do? They give you 500,000? Yeah, the military life insurance policies at the time was really generous, and it was a half a million dollars. So, yeah. My friend, <laughs> I, <know> Adam, <laughs> I, I walked through with my friend. Um, she, her husband. I never heard any of this stuff, though. She never told me any of this, but I heard a lot of, you know, about the, the medical and stuff because her son was always sick, and um, we threw him a big party when he got home, like the whole neighborhood did. Um, but I never heard of anything about this stuff, and he was in Fort Hood, so. Yeah, I don't yeah. think he was, I don't know, I'll have to ask him, but yeah, um, he was, he was gone a while. She had a baby and he was sick. It was, it was sucked. I walked through that with it's her and it was really, like, yeah. spouse doesn't get nearly the credit it deserves because it's, it's, it is a hard job. You are effectively, you know, it's nice because your bills are paid, you know, it's yeah. nice because um, you don't really have to worry, you don't have to worry about medical, you don't have to worry about, your, there's a lot of things you don't have to deal with. But at the same, on that same token, you are in effect a single parent. You could be permanently single parented. <laughs> like, what do they uh, do if on what spouse happens. dies? Like, if your spouse dies in the military, how does that work? Like, do you continue to get benefits for your life? So, if you are a permanent, because um, I have, I've had a single couple parent. Of yeah. Life. I mean, what do they? Uh, what I don't the think so. At least at the time that I was in, that wasn't the case. Like you would get your uh, life insurance payout. Um, the the child, uh, you depending on the soldier's time in service, could continue to receive um, Tricare. And but I mean that really it was like very dependent. It was something that at the time you had to battle for. So I'm hoping Gold Star spouses and Gold Star families are treated a little bit better now. Um, but I do know that Gold Star spouses can use the VA home benefits. What is Gold so Star Spouse about that? Uh, it's a soldier who's died overseas. Okay. And that's a program that the military offers? It's not a, it's not a program. It's just how they identify people who, okay. um, who uh, survivors of a soldier who's died in, get overseas. Gold Star. That's nice. Right. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, um, I know. <laughs> but they can use their, uh, their, their uh, deceased spouse's uh, VA benefits in some respects. So. Yeah, what about that housing? Is, that is, so, uh, housing, so no. can they use their VA loan? They, it, 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 under some circumstances, yes, they can still use the VA loan. But they, like, once the soldier passes, there's like they're given basically a time to leave. If they're on on post housing, they can't stay there uh, indefinitely. They have to leave within a certain time. So, what are the requirements for the? Do you know about the VA loan? And and if your spouse does die. What is the surviving spouse? What do they get as far as a VA loan? I'm just gonna because we're gonna be putting this out on real estate. It works the same as a VA loan. Um, it depends on how I, I believe it depends predominantly on how long that person was in the military. Um, so I mean, like if they were in for like you know a matter of weeks or you know in their unit for a matter of weeks, I don't think that it's eligible. But um, I'm still learning more about the gold uh, the gold star spouse program. So. But I, I did remember talking to a lender and that that was something that they could do. Uh, I'm just, I work more with veterans than their families. Okay. Yeah. Chad is a wealth of knowledge. The guy I introduced you to, he is the VA lender of, you know, uh, Michael is too. He's, he's very good. Um, so, you know, they're the best in the business uh, as far as I can see. Um, Natalie, I appreciate you and your time and, and your friendship, and I really love you, and I really, you're a badass bitch. <laughs> gun range, you're good. Shoot, shoot guns with you. It'll be fun. No, oh, man. I, like, I'm, I'm, I'm long overdue for some pew-pew therapy. Long Let's overdue. Go. Let's go. And my daddy Let's and my mama it. are watching. They probably love to do it, too. They've got, they've got so <laughs> many. <laughs> I love going to their house. It's fun. Um, but anyway, um, do you have any anything? So, Natalie, how do people get in touch with you? Um, well, they are free to call or text. Um, my number is 512-552-6715. Um, free to call and can connect anytime. Um, if you are, if, if you have experienced MST, uh, just need a safe place to explore that experience. 
I'm more than happy to just sit back and listen. Um, I do want to uh, make sure that people are aware that you are entitled to VA disability benefits due to MST. And um, I have a fantastic resource to help that helps walk veterans through that process because there is a, a lot of shame surrounding something like that because it's like, you know, perhaps the soldiers blaming themselves because men can be victims of MST as well. Like it's not just exclusive to women. It's predominantly women, but men can in fact be victims of military sexual trauma as well. And so, you know, there's shame, there's fear, there's a lot of negative emotions surrounding that experience. And the best thing to remember is that that's not something you did to yourself. That's not something that you are at fault for. And so it's not your fault. You have no reason to feel ashamed of it, but it will take time to work through those feelings. And that's 100% okay. It's a journey. You take your time, do it right. Don't rush through it. Do it right. There are a lot of, um, there's a lot of chat going on here. Um, let me just, can you open the chat, Ellie, and see if there's any questions? Yeah. We might <clears throat> Uh, it looks like, uh, 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 don't let me scroll up. Um, Melissa is, um, there we go. <laughs> now it's working. Now it's I said working. it's up here. Let's uh, see. So, um, Melissa is a, uh, is a veteran as well and has had some experiences and um, has quite a bit of input. I love that. Thanks, Melissa. Yeah. I love that. Melissa, what, what's your last name? And so we can, how can we reach out? To, how can Natalie reach out to you? Just. Shoot her a text. You got her number. Thank you yes, for your Ellie. service. Yeah, both of you and everybody. Thank you. And and you know what, Natalie, I know there's something that God has ready for you to do, and I hope that it it happens soon. And you're already doing it, but I mean, I hope it's big. I hope it's, and I'll help you, whatever, because I love, I love you guys too. And I, I, I'm gonna cry. Thank you. I'm gonna write down that. Hold on. Yeah, write it down. So, you want to copy and paste it? No, I'm going to write it down just because I'm old school and it actually helps me remember. Like, I have a photographic memory, so as long as I write something down, I can, like, addresses and things. My sister doesn't understand how I can remember half the crap I remember, and it's like, I wrote it down. It helps. Um, no, I'm, I'm actually writing. Uh, I'm, I've got a couple books that I'm in the process of writing, and I want to get published. So if you happen to know any book publishers, I love or do too. I'd love to chat. Yes. Um, Nolly Williams um, is actually uh, one of my old, he's my, one of my coaches from before I used to work with him and I'll connect you guys and see what he's got. Let's see. Do you see any comments or Ronnie said I've got yeah, okay. for some of us, it wasn't a matter of dedication, et cetera. When it came to li leaving Oh, really? You can post on Amazon for free, publish on Amazon for free, she says. You can. You can. I want to do the more old school way, though. Like, I'm just, I know I'm, how to do it. I got you. Yeah. I, got you covered. Okay. Uh, I got published in a magazine uh, uh, like two years ago for one of my short stories. Um, it was uh, Ralph Steadman, um, uh, Hunter S. Thompson's art, art, uh, like, uh, artist friend. He did this really cool painting and... Um, the Woody Creeker, which was Hunter S. Thompson's um, like magazine of sorts, uh, was had open submissions, and so I submitted my story, and it got published. Awesome! And uh, that just kind of really just made me be like, all right, okay. Right now, I have I've I've done this better than J.K. Rowling did. She tried to get published on numerous occasions and was rejected. And first go. Awesome. So well, you know what? I'm going to send this to Nolly, and I'm going to awesome. hopefully he'll respond. Um, and we'll see what we can do. I'm also going to put it out there everywhere. And uh, <laughs> I really just, there's a lot of communities that I'm a part of. Also, so when I was trying to come up with that whole um, housing, the, the the sick veterans and the homeless veterans and this and that, and the, the ones that were about to die, um, I was able to get, I think I told you this, I was able to get like the, the, the people that were head of each, on a Zoom call, four of them. They were the ones of Austin. They were like the, the head guys, like of Washington. I'm not kidding. So I'm gonna send that this to them too, and um, we're gonna get something going. We're gonna make a difference. Absolutely. 
really well. Right. And I have a friend, uh, well, a veteran who I just helped close on 10 acres uh, just outside of Waco in a little town called Mount Calm. And um, that's something he really wants to do is create um, like more or less an RV place for veterans to come and collaborate and, you know, sit around a fire pit and share war stories or life stories um, or silence. Even, well, they have you know, places. So they they, give have you, they fund you. They fund yeah. you and give you, you know, the stuff to use like for medical, like people that need medical services, they give you everything you need and they pay you to yeah. do it. So, That's awesome. Yeah, awesome. You, need to, you need to really, yeah, I'm going to hook you up. I know a lot of people, so we're going to get this done. Thank you, Natalie. I appreciate you, and I love you, and y'all have a good day, and thanks for coming to the podcast, Asia for Community. Thanks, everyone, for joining and for sharing, and I um, appreciate you being on this journey with us. Yes. Thanks, guys. Bye.